can uh, the, uh, get the meeting going here. I'm, uh, I was saying to John, I'm getting quite a few emails right now, so I'm very behind in emails. So, but uh, thank you all for joining us. Now we'll get uh, <clears throat> if we can get things going here. I guess John, uh, do you, do we need to take attendance, or you're you're doing that by looking at the Zoom or? Yeah, I see everybody. Everyone's here. I right. raise my hand if you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is uh, very good here. Okay. All right. So then the rest of the meeting dates. Okay. You know, one thing I did not grab was a flag for us to do the pledge, but I generally have one here on my desktop for these purposes. Let me find photos. We should be able to see a flag there. Can everybody see a flag? <laughs> yes. Very nice. Why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, start by doing the pledge and we'll make it official and we'll get the meeting going. So, Sarah Linda, you want to lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag United of the United States, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, which it stands. One, nation one nation under God. God. Indivisible. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we did it. We did it. All right. <laughs> it's official. You know, there's actually, from what I understand, there's actually a state law that says you can't have a meeting, a public meeting without a U.S. flag in the room. So, ah. Yeah. So anyway, from what I understand. So, okay. So we'll get, uh, we'll get things going here. Um, and uh, John, thank you so much for uh, all of your help in putting together this agenda and, and keeping us headed in the right direction. Very much appreciated. No problem. Welcome. Uh, and we get to officially welcome uh, Rocky, was appointed by the town board at the town board's last meeting. He's an official Environmental Conservation Board member now. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> Your Thank life you. will never be the same. <laughs> um, we did have a, I guess I want to have a, a, just a basic conversation here with you. Um, Rocky has uh, someone who is interested in also possibly serving on the Environmental Conservation Board. We still have one vacancy on the board. I also received a updated email last night from... Sarah Linda, I think you know him. Leaf, um, I don't remember his last name. Oh, Her Hergesel. Yes, I believe he wishes to also be considered for the Environmental Conservation Board. Um, so I don't know. It have has have you interviewed Leaf before for the Environmental Conservation Board? I don't believe he's been a candidate, but I I did. Um, I was sit in on an interview. Um, uh, with him for the position of town historian. He's okay. applied for that job. Oh. I guess he was, uh, he's, I guess he's very interested in getting involved with the town and uh, there may have been some confusion. I'll forward the email that he sent me last night, but he said that he was very interested in uh, possibly meeting with the Environmental Conservation Board to consider the uh, vacancy also. So, and then, um, Rocky, can you just touch base on the person that, that you had emailed me about also? Um, about what specifically? Um, just a little about the background and, and who the person is. And Okay, do you want that in an email? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, just... What, well, just uh, the, the individual, a male, female, I, it, it doesn't oh. matter, but I just don't. Don't remember. It was a female. Oh, yeah, she's female. female. Yeah. Okay, so she just so I've been talking in the right context. So, I believe she also had some uh, experience and interest in serving on the Environmental Conservation Board, and she also had some experience. It sounded like, right? Yeah, she um, worked uh, for the boat stewards in the past. She oh, has yeah. a degree in environmental science, and she's also a lawyer. Okay. What what's the pleasure of the uh, of the group? Would you like to set up maybe interviews separately of a meeting or or at the next meeting? Do you have a preference? You do it at the same same time uh, as a meeting. I would think. 
Okay. Yeah, I believe that's what we've done in the past. Yeah. Yes, it is. Good at the at the meeting would be great for me. I think that would be preferable. So should we then plan to invite uh, both candidates? And, and if there's anybody else that comes along, we can certainly invite them to the March meeting and then uh, we can kind of take that from there. So, okay. So, sounds good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Brock, does this person have a, a CV you can share with the, the board? Um, yeah, I can I can get one from her. Okay. I'll forward it once. Actually, I can, I can email it really quick and I'll I'll send it out once I get it. I'm going to make a note to myself also, and I'm going to send you uh, a Leaf's email from last night to uh, all the ECB members, so you have that all. So, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I guess that leads into D. I, and again, this is just a question. It's nothing that we have to do this evening if you don't like. But um, the election of the vice chair position, I, I don't believe we filled that. Um, do you want to continue to wait um, until we see who the other person is that uh, ends up getting appointed, or do you have a preference? Or is somebody dying to be the vice chair, or the chair for that matter? Deafening silence. I know yeah. this. <laughs> Seems to me a good idea to wait until we have a full complement of people, and then we can maybe have another conversation of the sort that, that Joyce had with a number of us before she left um, about what particular area of expertise, if any, the, these people would like to, um, um, you know, have be responsible for. Perfect. Okay. We'll, we'll all draw a straw. Kick the ball down the road. Yes. Kick the can. I think for the next meeting, I'm gonna have you all choose a number and I'm gonna draw a number out of the hat and then that person is the chair. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think I'm going to come down with something dreadful for the next meeting. <laughs> oh, you're funny. I just wanna scroll back up here. I see John, you have listed a confirmation of the calendar um, for the first Thursday of the month. So, I don't see any necessarily like conflicts or holidays that come to mind associated with that. The only one is it looks like July 1st is very close to July 4th. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's a, the Thursday, obviously. So it's not, it's, I guess if somebody was taking off Friday to do a long weekend, you might miss that, but otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can go back and readdress that uh, after we uh, fill that that uh, next vacancy. All right. Uh, jumping right ahead then, uh, John, I believe, had sent out the minutes for the January 7th meeting. Did anybody have any comments or corrections to the minutes? If not, we'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Don't move. Do we have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Is there any other discussion? I'm sorry. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody nay? No? Okay. So the minutes are approved. Uh, and then we come to the first privilege of the floor for uh, an item that's not on the agenda. I don't know if anyone has anything. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Report of the Development Office, and, and actually, I'll just lump these two together and, and feel free, um, some of you are on some of the other committees, and Pat, and feel free to jump in here also with the uh, CIC, but uh, the Development Office, uh, I was able to receive some interest in the position of town planner. Uh, we have um, three individuals that have been approved by Ontario County Civil Service for consideration. Uh, so we'll be getting those interviews probably in the next week or so. Um, the, the great thing is all three of the individuals are currently planners in other municipalities. So they all come with experience. So I was very excited about that uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, one of them is a, uh, is a county planner. So um, <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll uh, be 
doing those interviews here, like I said, in the coming weeks. And hopefully it's going to take a little bit of time, but uh, hopefully by the end of March, I would say we ha can have that uh, town planner position filled. In the meantime, Eric is continuing to uh, provide some assistance remotely part time. Uh, he is trying to respond to emails. I also am getting his emails as those come in. And um, Michelle and uh, Chris Jensen, uh, both from the development officer, are, are trying to take on some additional responsibilities as we kind of work through the through the transition there. So, um, then uh, anybody have any questions about the development office? Any, uh, no. Mm -hmm. The uh, citizens implementation committee continues to review the comprehensive plan, the the action items as we continue to move that forward. Um, I don't believe there was a specific referral to the ECB for from the CIC right now. Pat, I don't know if there's anything you want to add uh, relative to the CIC at this point. No, we were talking about town operations and how involved the whole process of the uh, town operations is and we're going to continue further review and I guess there were a few comments from a, a few committees that were sent to Eric and we were going to hope that he would update the plan and once that was done, revisit it. Um, just an ongoing feel is, is what I got from the CIC meeting of, of Tuesday. Um, it seemed like it's pretty involved and, and needs um, more discussion, more understanding, comprehension, things like that. Um, that's pretty general, I know, but... I think that's a fair assessment where I would say that I think things are at also it's uh, where, where you need to go back and um, get some updates with some of the comments that have been provided thus far yeah. and then uh, hopefully um, a, a more finalized version of the draft can then be forwarded back out uh, for a, a final look at. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doug, you mentioned the um, comprehensive plan and at our last meeting, we talked about the goals and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then subsequently, um, uh, I, I drafted a, 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 a slightly modified one with some more detail about water quality in particular. And also we got some emails from Joyce suggesting that something the rest of us overlooked, which is there already were a bunch of goals and objectives listed in other studies, the open space plan and maybe other places that perhaps should be lifted from there and plugged in here. So who's responsible for following up on that? Um, so I did forward that stuff um, it, both from both you and Joyce and uh, please everyone forward that to Eric's email address, ecooper at town of Canandaigua and I did forward that to him so he has that. Uh, and Eric is actually going to be assembling that stuff in, in for us and putting that together. He's still working part time for us specifically to help us finish up the comprehensive plan. So we don't need to do anything further on that. Um, I don't believe so. Not at this point. I will uh, follow back up on that, Sarah Linda. But um, he has that information and he's going to incorporate that in this. What I would call hopefully is more of a finalized draft that we can then go back and look at. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just had one more um, two cents to put in. We were asked to uh, to take in the um, Middle Cheshire Road um, program on Wednesday, yesterday, Wednesday at noon. And if we were not able to attend, it's going to be up on the Town of Canandaigua YouTube channel for us to look at. And um, we're going to be discussing that at our next CIC meeting. And they just asked for us all to uh, see if we couldn't observe that and have some thoughts or responses to that presentation. That's it. Yeah, that one, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Pat. That, uh, that one is a little bit of a time sensitive. So the town board on Monday night is scheduled to set a public hearing for the March town board meeting. Uh, on that plan. That one, uh, that plan specifically was funded, uh, that study was funded through a grant and um, it, there were delays due to COVID and a variety of different things, but what they've told us is we have to close that out by the end of March. So that mm -hmm. one has uh, become mm -hmm. a time sensitive on us. Mm -hmm. so. 
that uh, that information, that that full recording, uh, is available on the YouTube site. Actually, I was just okay. on the YouTube site a little bit ago, so I, I did see that it is there. So. Okay. All right. Anything else for the CIC comprehensive plan? Is anybody? So referral from the ordinance committee, uh, follow up if any on the referral from the ECB to the ordinance for planning issues related to Fallbrook Park, Sandy Bottom Drive, Poplar Beach. I actually, can one of you help me out what that was? Does anybody know? Yeah, it was probably me that made that suggestion. Um, we have seen a lot of um, uh, applications for variances in that very densely developed part of the northeast corner of the lake um, and the, the variances seem to be for um, uh, lot coverage allowances that are way over what the town permits and in many cases the existing condition is already way over the what the town permits and the applicants are looking for putting even more um, uh, pavement in what's what would otherwise be their yards so, um, and in addition, there are almost all, all any time that there's any development over there, there has to be a uh, variance request for setbacks because those lots are so small that there's virtually no way to do anything without a setback variance on the uh, front, the, you know, between the building and the road. So our suggestion was that the ordinance committee look at this and make some revisions to the uh, town code that acknowledge the fact that that particular zone is really not like the rest of the lakefront um, because it's so um, so much characterized by small lots and that maybe it should have different standards, different setbacks, different lot coverage, just, you know, rather than having every single application need a variance, let's see if we can't come up with some standards that make more sense for that particular neighborhood. Um, that's, that's a great, the, the, you know, you sum that up very, very well, Sarah Linda. Um, I, I believe one of the challenges, uh, because I was involved when we, we originally did that section of code, one of the, the challenges that we ran into, as you correctly point out, is, is that area is very unique. However, what we were told from a legal counsel at the time is we couldn't zone specifically for, for one area. So for instance, the regulations would have to be applicable to the entire RLD. We couldn't um, zones for a specific area. However, with what you just explained, that area is very unique. And I remember the suggestion was made at the time that maybe that needs its own zoning. Maybe that's RLD2 or RLD East or whatever the case, because it is very unique. And uh, that is definitely something I think that um, should be considered. The other thing is the ordinance committee, I know at the last meeting was discussing uh, pervious pavers and um, you know, if there should be some allowance uh, specifically, and again, it that was used as the example, exactly what you just talked about, Fallbrook, Poplar Beach, that type of an area, where a lot of times the zoning board, it's my understanding, is saying, okay, we will give you a variance if you use those types of materials. Um, I think the ordinance committee is interested in understanding the pros and cons, but I don't think that they've made up uh, any kind of uh, decision or direction in, in what that may entail yet, but it's definitely topical for sure. Um, how would you like to, how would you like to proceed on that? Should, would the, would you as the ECB or what, is there a group that would be interested in working on that or, or, or taking that on and maybe making some recommendations or what's, what's everybody's thoughts on that? What's the usual practice of the ordinance committee when, um, I mean, I would think that the planning board will sometimes make similar suggestions if they find themselves grappling with the same problem over and over again, isn't it, isn't there one of the uh, solutions to ask the ordinance committee to talk it over? And then in that case, does the planning board meet with them or do they designate somebody to go and meet with them or do they just put it in the ordinance committee's hands? What, what's the, the process? Well, and it really depends on the topic and the, the issue, but for instance, in something where the zoning board, so you do have um, 
a current zoning board member as well as uh, one of the or the alternate zoning board member are both on the ordinance committee as well as the planning board chairman. So uh, is on the ordinance committee along with a town board member, uh, representative of the development office. And then traditionally there's multiple town board members attending the ordinance committee. So um, they do get into conversations about variances that the uh, zoning board is experiencing. I think that might be why that this whole concept of the pervious pavers probably came up and, and the lot coverage on the smaller lots. Um, but we could certainly, as an environmental conservation board, make a recommendation that the ECB take a, a deeper, or I'm sorry, that the uh, ordinance committee uh, take a, a deeper look at it. And I know that at some point in time, the ordinance committee members also would be very interested in the ECB's comments relative to the discussion, for instance, pervious pavers and those sorts of things. So that could either be done by correspondence, communication, email, or it could be a joint meeting or or just anybody that can attend the, the meeting of the ordinance committee. Or we also, you know, all those meetings are recorded and, and we can certainly uh, view those and, and and provide feedback that way. So it's, it's whatever really you're the most comfortable with. Is there any tracking of variances issued uh, to, to look at patterns or is it just kind of the, the, the sense people say, like, yeah, I've seen this, I've seen this before, I've seen this before. Uh, I don't know if there's any, any accounting of which would, which would necessarily lead to maybe some changes in the, the zoning laws. Um, so we, you know, our, our town planner, that's one of the responsibilities that he was taking care of, uh, he and uh, Michelle both. And so they would track the variances so that they could um, identify common themes uh, which keep coming up. And for instance, uh, one that the zoning board had said to us, it's really ridiculous how many of the requests they were getting was uh, for swimming pools on the lake side of the, the house. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that is actually on the town board agenda for this coming Monday night because the town code allowed you to have swimming pools on the side of the house, but not in your backyard if you are on the lake um, in the area between the house and the lake. And so uh, that is on the town board agenda uh, for the town to consider an amendment to that. But uh, that came up exactly that way, looking at those variances that were repetitive. I will, um, I'll ask uh, Michelle if uh, she could provide us with the most up-to-date list on the variances. I don't, it's just not something I have off the top of my head right now, but I'll ask her to get that out to us and we can take a look at that and then um, revisit the whole Fallbrook uh, Park. And then uh, Sarah Linda, your, your main thought there was specifically the lot coverage, I believe, right? Is that correct? Lot, lot coverage and setbacks. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Anything else on that that we should be aware of? Well, there, there's another one that has um, uh, struck me whenever it comes up, it strikes me as a area where the ordinance doesn't make that much sense. Um, and this is RLD. It's the, the way that um, when, a, when, when you have a lot, a lakefront lot, that doesn't have frontage on Westlake Road, but rather it has frontage on a private drive, um, or whether it's, whether it's Westlake Road or a private drive, either way, um, the ordinance is interpreted in, in such a way that um, the space between the road or the drive and the building is the front yard, and the space between the, the back of the building and the lake is the backyard. And the, um, Re the, the requirements seem to be the same sorts of requirements that you would typically have for a backyard anywhere else in the town. The backyard either butting up to, you know, open land or somebody else's backyard. But in this case, it's open, it, the backyard is adjacent to the lake. But somehow or other, that's not addressed in the ordinance at all. It does, it, it's, there, there's nothing um, it, it looks like there hasn't been any thought given to the fact that the backyard on a lakefront property is in fact the lakefront, which in many ways is like a front yard because it's up, up against public property and you have people in boats going up and down and all that sort of thing. So that has always seemed to me to be an area where the ordinance didn't reflect reality very well. 
uh, at, at, for instance, there are also all these situations where the, the backyard requirement is 60 feet. Therefore, there always has to be 60 feet between the building and the lake. But there, in many, many cases, that's not possible. Um, it, almost, uh, almost all lakefront lots, I would suspect, or a great majority of them, um, are non-compliant. So that means that every time you want to do anything there between the building and the lake, you're in a non-conforming situation. And I don't know that that was ever really intended when the, when the ordinance was adopted, but uh, it seems silly. I mean, I mean, there's so many variance requests and so many of them are granted because they seem reasonable. Um, but on the other hand, they have the, the unfortunate side effect that the town begins to get the reputation that it's very easy to get a variance because you're all, most variance requests are approved and therefore people begin to think, well, you know, why should I pay attention to these laws? I can just go out and get a variance. And their engineers tell them that, in fact, because they can point to all these other cases where people have gotten variances. So that's the, that's the um, background to what bothers me about that particular set of, uh, of, of standards. All right, I made a note of that. And um, what I'll do is um, I'll get that information from Michelle, but I'll also send Gary Davis, uh, who's the chair of our ordinance committee, an email and I'll uh, copy you all on it and uh, ask him to put those on his radar and see what he says about uh, getting those on a schedule so that they can be discussed more. So, okay. Okay. Um, and then we have referrals from, uh, from PRC. Oh, my mouse just stopped working there. Um, Sarah Linda, I believe that you had reviewed these and provided some initial comments. Let me see if I can pull those up here for a quick second. Or do you want to touch on this first one uh, relative to John Casey? Uh, sure. And it, it wasn't, I didn't do them all. I did Casey and um, um, Metros and Justin did the one for, um, uh, for the Morrell subdivision. Um, however, we got a note from Chris yesterday saying that we should not consider the one, uh, the Morrell one, because the town board was going to do it first. So I'm not sure if that should be deleted from the agenda or if you want us to talk about it anyway. Um, let's just touch base on it in a, in a, well, let's touch base on it a second. I'll bring it up, pull it up in just a second. Let's touch base on it. Um, I was just pulling up the Casey, um, let me share my screen here again. It's just pulling up the Casey, um, application here. So, so Sarah Linda, if, if you could take the lead on this and kind of walk us through, it's been a little while since I've looked at this, so. Um. Yeah, this is, um, this is quite an interesting one. <laughs> um, and if you can pull up some photographs, that would be helpful too. Um, we, have a, we have some photos uh, let's see, I sent, yeah, um, these are photographs from March 2020, and this pretty much represents the existing condition. Um, no, no additional work has been done since March 2020. Um, but there are some photos uh, which I sent Chris yesterday, and he said he put them in the folder for this project. They're, they're from before this work happened, so Oh, uh, let's see. Um, they're, they're photos from the fall of 2019. Um, is there another sort of folder that goes with this project? Not what, not what's on the board? Well, he, he may have put them. There's a, there's a, I have to stop that for just a quick second. Let me grab, there's a, uh, in the M drive we keep Documents for properties. Let's see, County Road 16. That number was, uh, what was that number? Um, 3814, right? 3814, yes. All right, let me share my screen here again. Let's see. Thank you. 
Uh, well, don't see it. Okay, well, well, we can do without the photos. Um, it does have this comparison from... Uh, yeah, and Ariel from 18, from 2018. Like an older pictometry shot, perhaps. I think this. Yeah, that's the closest we've got. Oh, that's got some pictures in it. So that's good. Um, OK, so let's go going back to 2019. Um, the ECB did review this, this project um, in the context of the new house that John Casey built across the road from here. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a vague recollection of that. Um, we talked about the, the curb cut and the retaining wall and the driveway patterns and so on. But at that time, he wasn't proposing doing anything different on the lakeshore. And the lakeshore was just a, a shale beach like this um, with a fairly steep bank going up to the road and uh, really no improvements there. Although the space between the steep bank and the driving lane was already paved with concrete pavers or something like that. So, so there was some substantial parking, um, a, a parking lane there. Um, a couple of, I, um, also in the fall of um, 2019, we were asked to consider the one change that was proposed at the lakefront was to relocate a shed that was now, what was uh, on the other side of the property and on the on the part across the road there was an existing shed that was 10 feet by 18 feet and mm -hmm. john casey was proposing to actually relocate that shed down to the lake shore um, so uh, that was that was the only thing that we considered and our comment was we thought it was a little we were a little skeptical that the that the shed would survive <laughs> that would, would survive the move but we didn't say no, uh, and the zoning board subsequently approved the necessary variance for that to happen. Um, and the variance was necessary because of the size of the building, because typically you would only be allowed to have a uh, one, 100 square foot building. This is a 180 square foot building, but um, the fact that it already existed elsewhere on the site, I guess, caused them to decide, well, this is, it, it's already a non-conforming situation. All he's doing is moving it I guess it's okay. So anyway, then uh, in the spring of, oh, and meanwhile, John Casey had gone through the process of getting approval from the DEC for some, um, some changes to the shoreline itself, but he didn't propose that to the town. Um, he just had, had, he got the DEC permit for it. Then he went ahead and did some work um, and a stop, or a stop work order was issued in the spring of 2020 because um, the building inspector noticed two things. One was he was not building in compliance with what he had said with DEC, and the other one was he had never gotten approval from the town. So, mm -hmm. the, so the project ground to a halt, and the state it was in is where what you saw on those photos that Doug pulled up to begin with, um, and what is shown on this. Uh, yeah, this, well, no, this is the current um, site plan. There's another site plan from April of 2020. That's the mm -hmm. sort of in between stage. And there, there were a few things um, that, were, that were not quite kosher about it. One of them was he proposed to build a lift um, up here towards the top. There is a, a box there that is a lift that would allow somebody in a wheelchair to um, enter up at the road level, go down to the lake level, and then exit. And you can see this uh, path, which is made of, of pavers um, that would cross the whole lakefront and uh, give access to this, this uh, 10 by 18 building, which is no longer the same building he was talking about rebuilding. Instead, it's a new building because in fact, as we feared, the building fell apart and they had to demolish it. Um, so he's asking for a new building, 10 by 18, uh, and all of the required variances that would go with that, a variance because of the distance from the lake, a variance because the building is uh, uh, 180 square feet as opposed to 100 square feet. Um, so this is, uh, and the other, the other thing that was the dispute with DEC was, um, 
what he did was to put in a whole row of uh, riprap boulders here, something like that boulder stone that we've seen on some other shoreline um, frontages, and then put in a lot of fill behind it. So he raised the grade and in fact, got himself some new lakefront that he hadn't had before. Um, so uh, after work ground to a halt, he did, um, between the town and the DEC and Mr. Casey, they arrived at a um, uh, solution that it was acceptable to everybody. Some of the riprap and fill that was installed will be removed and reinstalled back closer to where the shoreline originally was. And that's this sort of long triangle that you see down at the lower right part of the of the site, that's the section that's going to be undone of uh, the work that was done about a year ago. So um, anyway, that's all background. The I'll, I'll read you or sort of summarize what is in the in the draft referral here. Um, the application is for shoreline improvements at the lakefront portion of the lot 3814 County Road 16. A shoreline stabilization and associated shed were proposed and approved. Variances were granted, stop work order, revised site plan. Um, we're now um, looking for approval of the variances that are needed to go ahead and build this. Um, the work includes construction of the riprap wall, um, fill, no, wait a minute. That, this is the work, the work that was done um, without an approval was construction of the new riprap wall, fill, construction of a ramp from the road that goes down. This is that kind of diagonal thing that's between the new building and the lift. That diagonal thing is a kind of a, a, a stone covered um, ramped pathway. Installation of, of pavers at the lake level, um, the construction of the lift housing um, and a block retaining wall to go at the back of the new shed building so um, the new site plan, um, uh, new application uh, for consideration today includes shifting of the riprap wall and the fill back uh, away from the lake and toward the road uh, partially. Um, the lift structure that, that was built was actually built partly in the right of way. And so the remedial work here is going to be to remove that and rebuild it on Mr. Casey's property. Um, and the rest of the work is completion of what was proposed here, the paver um, uh, pathway, um, which we can see in the pictures, um, it was sort of half done um, before the stop work order. No changes are proposed to existing plantings other than a group of a couple of small um, uh, shrubbery beds close to the close to the new um, um, shed structure. There's there's this thing in the lower right is the the earthen ramp that I mentioned. It's got um, uh, kind of a stone dust surface to it, and there are going to be paver stones laid in that. And then the flat pavers down close to the lake near the riprap wall, that's what he has in mind. Um, and in the site plan, the, the interim site plan, now this, this is from about a year ago, that's the, that's the bank, the retaining wall and this um, ramp down to the, down to the lake level. Um, the interim plan did show a dock system the dock system now doesn't appear on the site plan, but I don't think that's because he doesn't want to do the dock. I think it's just because he doesn't have to show the dock uh, because the dock is not subject to town review. So even though a dock isn't shown here, I believe there is an, the intent to put a, a fairly substantial dock system with, you know, possibly uh, boat hoist covered stuff, not, not unlike what's, what his neighbors have to the north and south. Um, so environmental concerns. Number one, pavers and the stone path occupy a substantial portion of the lakefront part of the site. This is a high level of impervious surface compared to the town's usual standards for sites close to the lake, although it is in compliance due to the large size of the lot. 
um, this law, I mean, usually when we have a situation such as over at Fallbrook Park, as we were, as we were discussing, um, uh, or anywhere really, the lot coverage um, calculations deal with the entire site. In this case, the entire site is both sides of the road and, and it's a big site anyway. So it's many acres, maybe 50 acres or something like that. So if you do the lot coverage calculations, it's still a tiny portion of the, um, uh, it's a very, very low lot coverage ratio. And yet it's a very high lot coverage ratio if you were to just look at the lakefront part of the lot. So that's, that's, that's the top of the one of the concerns. Second one is drainage. All drainage on the lakefront portion of the site, most of it a steep grade or steep slope goes directly to the lake, apparently including some runoff from the road down the ramp during heavy storm events. And that was one of the things I was showing in this photograph that we were not seeing. But if you look at that earthen ramp uh, with the stone dust covering on it, you can see that it's already eroded away to yeah. a to you know, to a certain degree, and that's an indication that probably that some water is coming off Westlake Road and draining into that, and you know, heading on down into the lake. Um, no measures are proposed to slow this or to promote infiltration. Third concern: the 10 by 18 accessory structure is substantial and will be quite conspicuous in the context of other similar properties in the area although a variance was granted in 2019 for the relocation of a shed of similar size. Um, fourth one is the shoreline guidelines letter is a cursory effort to address the town's intent for visual buffering. Um, there is a letter in there, but it's pretty much says, you know, we're not doing and making any changes. There is a tree there, it's gonna stay. And we're putting some, some new shrubs in, but it doesn't really, make a very serious effort to address the intent of the shoreline guidelines, which is to um, soften the hard surface development along the shore and um, uh, have, have some more plant material, basically more trees. So, um, and the last one is proposed improvements relate directly to the applicant's desire for wheelchair access to the lake but approval appears inconsistent with the town's general encouragement to minimize impervi impermeable surfaces near the lake and could contribute to an unfortunate precedent. Um, so this, this is um, the rationale for this work overall is that John Casey uses a wheelchair and it, it is not able to get access to the lakefront without the lift and, and the, the paved surfaces. Um, so, well, I think that's um, certainly justifiable. On the other hand, I, I question whether it's a good idea to allow a permanent change simply because of the disability condition of the applicant. Um, so that comes up in the recommendation. So here's the draft recommendation. That the applicant revise the plan to include permeable paving materials and drainage measures to slow runoff and promote infiltration and to better address the town's guidelines for shoreline plantings to buffer the visual impact from the lake. And number two, that the ZBA consider conditioning the area variances with limitations to ensure removal or reduction in size of the wheelchair required structures and pavement on expiration of this owner's particular need. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know about the legalities of that, maybe between Rocky and Doug, you, if you wanna tell me we can't do that, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but it seems to me to be a good thing to consider um, because if you get a variance here that's really predicated on a unusual circumstance of one owner, um, when that circumstance goes away, it seems to me it would be reasonable for the variance also to go away. Just my hmm. personal opinion. Well, it seems to me that he's already indicated he's quite willing to disregard any uh, regulations from DEC or from the town or whatever in order to fulfill what he wishes to do. And when he gets caught, then he'll have to back it up. But this is a new shed. It's not the old shed. And as far as the variance being granted for the old one, I don't see why it would apply to a new construction. 
it, this whole thing makes me think of the old story about the camel wanting to put his nose in the tent <laughs> and then pretty soon his neck and then pretty soon, you know, it's, it just seems as though it's, um, you know, and there isn't any reason or any, any structure to keep road runoff from hitting the lake and from taking out that bank there you know there is nothing in terms of a of a swale or anything to catch the runoff that i can see there doesn't seem to be much interest in uh, trying to mitigate the problems that are being caused by this i mean <laughs> well that's that's what the what the recommendation suggest that you know they, they take a look at those things and yeah do, do some remediation yeah they need to put in an infiltration berm something to and they need to absolutely do something to prevent erosion from the road going down that I mean, it's already happening you know it's uh it seems to me it's it's uh he's <laughs> They're banking very heavily on not running into trouble because they own a lot of property across the road. But this little piece is right on the lake. It's uh, not doing much to protect it at all. And I would agree that that removing the the ramp and the the service would be, you know, that would be a good thing to do. I don't know if we can require it can ask it. Well, and I guess that's what I would also say, Sarah Linda, about your recommendation there. I mean, that's, um, I don't know that it's legal or not either, but it, it certainly, um, I think the wording that you've used there would at least draw to question, is that something that should be looked at? And so that the variance just doesn't go in perpetuity with the property. Yeah. So I think it's um, I think it's perfectly something if the ECB wants to leave it in there. I think you could certainly leave it in your recommendation. I asked, I wanted to ask also, um, you know, the blue line there that's showing the original mean high water uh, mm -hmm. line. Um, it, it, is there any consideration to the uh, that the ECB wants to reference? You kind of saw that in some of the photos there as uh, Sarah Linda was, was talking there about how close the water was to the tree. And now you see how far away it is. <laughs> to the, the not, tree. Yeah. yeah, I really don't understand how DEC let them get away with this because they're, you know, anybody who wants to work on their seawall, they've got all these rules that you absolutely have to, you can't encroach on, on the lake any more than you, um, that, that you were. And now all of a sudden here, they've allowed them to grab a whole lot of lakefront that used to be lake. Um, yes, and then he wanted more besides, and then illegally went <laughs> built out into it. I don't, I don't see it. <laughs> but, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to tell them we think that they should, they should rip the whole thing out and go back to the old shoreline? That's, uh, well, I think the shoreline will eventually come out and meet them. You know, a mean high water mark is just that. It's not. It's not the absolute high water mark. <laughs> it, it's just um, what is usually there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, with the erosion coming from the road and then all that hard surface yeah. you know, being submerged, it's just going to knot that bank much quicker than they probably anticipate. We get a good uh, ice event that'll be chewed right away. I mean, the other concern would be for uh, the road itself. I mean, eventually that could start eating back into the road and um, just by not having enough stuff there to help alleviate that additional runoff. Maybe we should ask for more plantings and plantings that are intended to get their roots in really good to a, a bank area and, oh, I don't know, like a pacasandra or a ground vetch or 
something that would help hold in the bank, mm -hmm. maybe a planting schedule or something like that to just press a little more our concern for the shoreline guideline portion of this project, you know? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Just and ask them for a landscape plan or like we do for, you know, a lot of other properties. Mm -hmm. It's probably important on this one. I think um, an appropriate thing to do would be to add one more bullet point there to the environmental concerns that specifically addresses the bank. And yeah. that says, uh, first of all, we're concerned that there's going to be even more bank erosion. Um, uh, and second of all, um, we, we would like to see a planting plan that with a focus on stabilizing the bank, having plantings that roots get in there and yeah. will hold on to the soil. I like that idea. I think so. I think that's important. Okay, and then I can also mention the bank in the first one of the recommendations. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make those changes, send them to John. Okay. Are there any other comments on this application? Thank you for walking us through that, Sarah Linda. Do we uh, wanna officially uh, take a vote on the recommendations. Uh, do a motion, a second, and we'll do a vote. That way, we've got it official. How's that? Mm -hmm. Sarah Linda, do you, would you be interested in making a motion uh, since you've kind of got the stuff there and <laughs> you've prepared it? I, I move that um, a recommendation be adopted as presented with the change that we will. Um, add a, a provision advising them to give more attention to the to stabilizing the bank and landscaping it. Mm -hmm. I will second. Okay. The first and a second. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that, uh, and, and John, just for, for your use in, um, in this, the, the text that we should use is the one that uh, Chris Jensen provided some edit, edits to. He's got some uh, in red, there's some strikeouts in red, there, and then yeah, some and then there's text in blue. Some, yeah, so, so in, that, that's the one that we want to adopt. Um, yep. Yep, thank you. Got it. All right. This uh, this next one here on your on your list, uh, Morale Builders, <clears throat> um, and Sydney Wilkin, uh, the owners of property at Stabler Twenty One South and Paris Street Extension. Let me just give you a real quick uh, show you kind of what's going on here. Um, and I think I want to do the overhead rendering also here to be able to show you. So um, Morel said, while that's loading, Morel's had come in uh, some time ago and uh, received approval to construct, um, I, I want to say it was approximately 60, and, and I'm going to do this off the top of my head, and I'm going to mess this up, but uh, approximately 60 homes on what's known as the Miller parcel. Mm -hmm. um, and that's right at the corner of 21, where where 21 makes the bend. This is actually Miller Park right here. Uh, mm -hmm. And then this was the Miller parcel here. So this would be County Road, that'd be County Road 32 that extends out, out past there. And here's five and 20 in the bypass. And the original plan that they came in and brought in, and, and I don't know if that's right here or not. And of course it's not where uh, I wanted to show you here real quick, but- um, Doug, we, um, did, we did review it. Um, you did review it. It's here for yeah, so This is familiar. We reviewed it a couple times because they kept revising mm -hmm. the plan. Okay. Yeah. All right. So basically, what what they've what they've done now is um, they and this isn't a very good. Give me just a second here. I want to show you something that's a little bit better while while I'm pulling that up. Um, one of the things that they did is they began working with Sidney Wilkin, who owns property over on Paris Street Extension. He owns a considerable amount of property there. And um, 
one of the things that they started uh, working on and talking with him about is the possibility of uh, partnering up there and connecting uh, and coming out on um, coming out over on uh, Paris Street Extension instead of instead of coming out uh, and, and looping it back around where it was. I'm just opening a couple of documents that I'm gonna share with you here in just a second. Let me jump back over here to share my screen. So <clears throat> here's a, a little bit better uh, view of it, but basically what they're looking to do is to, instead of wrapping back around and coming back out onto 21, they're, they're looking to build a product that is more coming in off of 21 and then uh, a flow all the way through and exiting over onto Paris Street Extension. Uh, and that is the low point there on Paris Street Extension. One of the things that, uh, you know, of course, they like to point out to me is that they could build, I want to say it's 60 homes on the Miller parcel, I, I want to say is what the current town code would allow. Maybe it's 50. It looks like 50, maybe. Um, <clears throat> 57. No, I take that back because the 50 wraps there and then it wraps all the way around up here to 80. That's mm -hmm. uh, well, that includes all of them. I think it was 50 on the one. And then um, if they included the other parcel, technically they could build 80. And, and that's basically what they're trying to show here is that they could construct 80 homes, uh, single family homes. Instead, what they're hoping to do is to um, build a product that is a little bit more like uh, what we see over at the villas at Cheshire Glen. And what they're looking to do is to construct 92 units. There's a caveat in the town code that allows them to increase the density uh, if the town board approves it. And what they're talking about doing and, and the, the argument that they wanna make to the town board is, to get approval to build those other 12 units, to have 92 units in totality. And you see all of the green space and the wetlands and, and they're proposing a variety of trails and, and a variety of different things. What they're, what they're gonna make the argument is, is that they're going to um, protect basically all that open space uh, trade off in exchange for those additional 12 units. And they, they would increase the amount of open space in total to 72 acres of the total 95 acres would actually be open space. Um, so the first step is this is actually going to planning public works of the town board tomorrow uh, for the town board to start to have the conversation. Would they entertain that caveat that's allowed in town code for that 15% increase in density? Uh, basically in exchange for the additional open space. Here's some of, I'll just show you, share this with you quickly. Um, 25 two unit, 14 three unit uh, construction. They're trying to make it look like these homes are single family homes, even though they're not, they're a, they kind of have different uh, entrance points. Um, you can see they would be continuing to use a portion of the Sid Wilkin parcel for agriculture. And uh, they, they're very interested in an elaborate trail system that comes back around and then uh, would connect over to Miller Park and the existing trails that are, that are there. Um, they've documented that. One of the things that I did ask them to do is to um, go over to Miller Park and, do, and actually to float a balloon <laughs> so that we would see if there would be any visual impact of where the roof lines of these homes would be from Miller Park. And um, you can actually see here in some of the work that they did is you wouldn't even be able to see the rooftops of the houses because of the natural topography of the grade. And that's something that they would be uh, looking to work with. The, uh, the houses would actually be down in this, um, in this little valley uh, down here. So um, just overall, it, that's kind of what they're, they're looking to do. Um, the first step really is they've got to present to the town board for the town board to even consider whether or not they would do the increased density to allow the project to move forward. And um, I would anticipate that uh, probably what would happen is the town board would want to hold a public meeting, public hearing on that. My guess is that would be at the April meeting. So I think this one's probably going to kick around for a little bit. So um, mm -hmm. just kind of to give you a 30,000 foot on what's going on with it. So. 
once the town board so, uh, officially sets the public hearing, then they'll refer it to the Environmental Conservation Board also for comments and feedback. So, mm -hmm. so Doug, I had a question. Um, I guess based on on the town board's decision on that, if it's not granted, would this then revert back to the other development plan with the eighty? houses or would this continue forward just at a reduced number? I, I think it sounds like they would revert back to the other plan. Okay. Um, and they haven't, uh, you know, those, those were just general conversations, but uh, obviously they're a developer who's looking to make money, right? So they, they mm -hmm. it's, it's got to be uh, something that's uh, for them uh, that they can take to market and then uh, sell the product. And the other thing that they said to me is that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the demand is actually greater for, uh, you know, these types of units is what they're seeing right now than the single family residential homes. People are looking for something with a little less maintenance, a little easier to care for uh, at a variety of different stages uh, in, in life. And um, they think that this product would market a little bit better than the single family residential homes. Hmm. Doug, I, I listened to the, um, uh, the PRC meeting at which they discussed this and Jeff Morell was in on the, the Zoom meeting there. So he gave his presentation, which I assume he'll do to the town board also. Um, one of the points he made was uh, they wanted to propose to the town that the town take on ownership and maintenance of all of this common area. Um, although he did say, even if the town says no, they will still do it uh, and they'll maintain it themselves in the same manner that they do with Lakeview Meadows, which is their other comparable development down there on, on uh, Middle Cheshire Road. So. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a bunch of arguments about why it would be advantageous for the town to own this and manage it, it together with Miller Park. Um, and that was one of the things that caught my eye because this is the, the area on the parcel that's sort of light green, that's all grassland, which is the same thing that Miller Park is. And that's really great bird habitat um, in a way, you know, grassland that only gets mowed once a year, late in the year, so, so that um, uh, birds like bobolinks and meadow larks and so on can uh, enjoy it in the, um, in the spring and summer. So uh, I, I didn't know whether with everything else that's going on with the town and parks and everything, if the town would even consider taking on another this is another 40 acres or so. I mean, it's half the size of Onanda Park for heaven's sakes, um, or maybe even more. Um, we, I did have a very, very brief conversation with him about it. I also had a, a brief conversation with Kevin Olvaney about it. One of the uh, other interesting, I, I guess as I would say, aspects of this particular project is that wetland and that uh, tributary actually flows back to Sucker Brook. And um, that was actually one of the areas, this was actually one of the uh, tributaries um, that uh, we had originally identified as possibly doing some Sucker Brook water quality improvements. Um, and so maybe there's an opportunity to do something along that lines uh, where it becomes part of a water quality improvement project, whether it's owned by the town or the HOA and, and whether the watershed council is involved with the maintenance of it or the uh, construction of it. I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's probably more questions and answers right now, uh, but it's good to get all those types of different things on the table and then really explore what, what makes the most sense for everyone. Mm -hmm. When the time comes, Justin has already written up a, a referral report and a bunch of recommendations. So um, we'll, We'll deal with them when the time is right. I believe that the planning board is still going to at least um, have a conversation about it next Tuesday night, uh, but it, it sounds like they're probably just going to, they might make some initial comments, but they're probably just going to continue it um, as it kind of works through its process with the town board. So. Has there been any feedback from Light Hill, the uh, comfort home, hospice home, which is going to be pretty pretty close to this development on, on Perry Street Extension. I, I assume they'll have an opportunity to, to voice any, any concerns, but they're, they're... Um, So that's the, that's the other thing that um, 
you know, we I, I had sent a note over to uh, Chuck Euler, who's our planning board chair. I know we've heard from uh, the Sutherland House, um, and then Light Hill, I believe, is right here, I believe. Um, <clears throat> we didn't actually, the development office didn't actually officially send out referrals. This was a sketch, and then this really needs to go to the town board. So that was another reason why I asked the planning board if they would continue the hearing so that we could send out official notices, even though it is a sketch, so everybody has a chance to provide some input and feedback and everything. But you're right, it would be uh, relatively close to, uh, yeah. I was told, <clears throat> I did ask about that, and I believe what they said is um, that the tree line, the natural vegetative uh, tree line there would actually buffer it naturally uh, versus the, um, where they would be constructing the homes and that they felt like there would be minimal impact, but it's definitely something that needs to be taken into account. Sure. Okay. Right. Any other, I don't think we actually need to um, take any motion or anything on that one. Um, and then the next one, uh, Mark's engineering for um, Bristol Road. I think this one is coming back to see us again, I believe. Right. This one is uh, uh, somewhat quicker. You want, you want me to? Sure. Yes, please. Um, go through this. OK. This is the one on Bristol Road that's the next door neighbor to the hammocks. Um, it's a long, thin site plan. Um, we've seen it in sketch form, and then we saw it in preliminary subdivision form, and now we're seeing it in final subdivision form. Um, so in, we'll look at the site plan. Um, it'll look very familiar. It's a, a parcel of 7.4 acres um, with about 175 feet of frontage on Bristol Road, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, the planning board gave preliminary site plan approval in October of 2020. Um, oh yeah, go go back up to the site plan. There or one of. Oh, okay, that that one's good. Um, originally, the cul-de-sac was a little bit farther um, farther into the parcel, and one of the comments that we one of the suggestions we made early on was to pull it back so that there was less. Um, I can't remember the rationale exactly, but I, I think it made the the lot somewhat bigger. Um, and less road. And that is what they ended up doing as a final adjustment between the preliminary approval and what they're looking for now is the final approval. Um, so lots 10, lot 11, maybe about the same, but lots 10, 9, 8, and 7 are all modified a little bit from the earlier plan. Um, if you remember the earlier plan on the uh, eastern edge, which is the bottom of the site plan here, there used to be a sidewalk and also a, a buffer line of evergreen trees. And they have eliminated that in this plan. Um, I don't know that there was any real rationale except that uh, probably money. Um, uh, and instead of the evergreen buffer that would shield this property from the hammocks, uh, they're saying there already is a buffer of existing vegetation and we wanna just leave that. Although the, the width of this buffer um, strip is pretty darn small there, maybe. I don't see the dimension, but doesn't look like more than maybe 10 or 15 feet at the most. Um, so those are, those are two changes, removal of the trail sidewalk, elimination of the evergreen hedge, and then a revised lot, lot layout for lots eight to 10 reducing the length of the common roadway and increasing the length of the private drives for those last three houses. Environmental concerns. ECB has reviewed this project several times. The, ex the concerns we expressed at that time do not appear to have been addressed. Notably, those about the potential for retaining and protecting existing mature trees on lots eight through 10. Um, this is a parcel that is partly wooded uh, fairly fairly heavy woods there for the entire, let's say, two thirds um, short of the, the road frontage, which is just a cleared field. Um, so there are, you know, it, it's not old growth forest, but it does have some fairly large trees. And one of our recommendations the last time was that the um, owner survey the 
the tree inventory, at, particularly in those larger lots toward the back of the cul-de-sac and uh, retain any trees that were feasible to retain as yard trees for those. Um, so I don't see any evidence that they paid any attention to that recommendation. Um, second thing is we remain concerned about the mechanics through which the conservation lands at parcel 11 will be protected and maintained. So this is coming in as a conservation subdivision, which means that there will be a conservation easement on lot number 11. Not lot 11 doesn't have a house on it, it's just pure woods. And the owner of the, the developer here intends to um, build for himself on lot 10, the, the one at the very back of the cul-de-sac. And then he intends to hold title to lot 11 himself. Um, so the question we raised in our earlier review was who's going to be responsible long term for keeping, keeping this woods, lot 11, um, you know, honoring the subdivision and taking care of the woods. Um, is there going to be a homeowners association, for instance, this is a pretty small subdivision to have a homeowners association, but, um, uh, you know, there, there just were a bunch of questions that we said really should be resolved before the approval is got done. And I don't see any evidence that those, that any progress has been made. That doesn't mean it hasn't, I just don't see it. Um, so let's see. Um, that's the, okay, that's the second environmental concern. And the third one, we regret the applicant's decision to eliminate the sidewalk and the walking trail, two pedestrian friendly features of the earlier proposal. Likewise, we regret the substitution of an existing vegetation buffer for the evergreen row proposed earlier, as the existing scrubby deciduous trees and shrubs are not likely to mature into healthy year-round landscape buffer between the subdivision and the neighboring apartment complex. So the recommendation is that the applicant inventory any large trees in lots eight, nine, and 10 for protection and continued life as yard trees, if possible. Repeat recommendation from 10.120. That the matters of ownership, management, and use of the conservation parcel and trail, or actually I should take out and trail because there is no trail anymore, the conservation parcel be resolved prior to final approval. That's also a repeat recommendation. And that the applicant reconsider the decision to eliminate the sidewalk and evergreen hedge. Um. Sarah Linda, would you, I, I, I think you did a great job there of uh, really reviewing that and detailing that. The, the one thing I might suggest that the ECB consider is the language that you were talking about, I, I think is spot on. I might just add um, that the applicant should seek approval from the town board of the town of Canandaigua for acceptance of the conservation easement prior to the planning board approving, because what they're showing here is that the conservation easement is going to be given to the town of Canandaigua. And I can tell you that has not come before the town board. <laughs> so. okay. I mean, it, it may be that the intent is to have the homeowners association responsible for the conservation easement, but how that all works with only 10 owners is, you know, the, 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 I can see management issues in the long run, particularly when Mr. Metro's is no longer the owner. Right. Um, so, all right. We, so you're suggesting that we add that as a recommendation that, that the applicant seek town board approval for the conservation easement. What about if it's not the town that they're looking for? Well, that, that would be fine, but it says right here on the plan, conservation easement to town of Canandaigua. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, good point. Okay. <laughs> Prior to planning board approval. Okay. Did uh, others have other comments? I just had one, I guess, um, the continued easement that they show for the town and stuff uh, that goes back past uh, property number 10 and at the corner there, uh, 411. Does that mean that there's some kind of future, I guess, connection there or, 
uh, I guess, for understanding why do we why do we need to show that on there? Why do they need to show that on there? You're talking about right here, Justin. Can you yeah. see this? Yeah, I think it's the dashed line that kind of goes around as well up by the other parcels. I saw if this will let me scroll down. My computer is bogging down on me today, but I saw. So that's to clear. I did see on. I think it was the next line. Let's see here. Maybe it was the next one. Yeah, so the utilities, it looks like, are predominantly up here. This is water, it looks like, coming in uh, with the laterals. They do show like a stub. My guess is this is like a turnaround, like a, for the car to turn around and go back out. Yeah, I, I don't know what this is. It's not, it's not super clear. I think in one of the reviews we had had in there just, you know, like you had mentioned that turnaround spot there that kind of fed into the last parcel there. And if the intent was for, you know, ever to be additional development or something back there um, that, you know, just made aware of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I guess I don't know why you would have that going all the way back there if there's no planned or future development in that area. Well, it does seem like a good idea to to have uh, enough land there associated with parcel 11 so that there could be you know access there could be a road I mean some I, say you need to have a forester in there removing trees or something you, you need to have a way to get back there without going through somebody mm -hmm. else's yard Yeah, sorry, just a question. There, when we first looked at this, there was there was talk about a trail that would go along this eastern edge of the parcel and then all the way back to the back corner of the hammocks and then possibly across the back of the hammocks and connect into trails at, in, in the city of Canandaigua. But there were some discussions about that and it turned out the city wasn't in favor of it, didn't want it, and the hammocks wasn't interested, and so they gave that all up. I think this particular sheet is out of date. That that one, the cul-de-sac looks different from the does look On different, doesn't pages. it? Yeah. It does. I noticed that also. It does look a little different. Okay. Is there any other comments on this one? It does reference the existing vegetative buffer there, but boy, it looks like it's a pretty small vegetative buffer. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Sarah Linda, since you wrote up the recommendations, can I call on you to do a motion on that one? I move that the um, recommendations as uh, presented in our draft be adopted with the exception that we will um, add a third recommendation that the applicant seek town board approval for the conservation easement uh, prior to the approval by the planning board. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. So we have first and second. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. The ayes have it. So I believe that concludes the referrals. Um, old business. Pat, I get to turn it over to you. OK, all. Um, well, our topic for February, um, which did you all get a chance to read the latest and greatest newsletter? Uh, Gary wrote a wonderful article about the problem of plastics, very informative. Um, 
And going on into our following month, uh, Edith has already um, given me an, uh, a very wonderful article about trees, how to plant trees and various information about trees. Uh, I could share with you guys in a, in a separate email. So now we're thinking of going into the following month which would be our month of April. And just was wondering if anyone had received an email from me with any, any ideas that anyone thought they would like, like us to talk about in the newsletter. Well, I had one idea. Um, I'm not volunteering to do it, but I'll make the suggestion anyway. And that okay. is um, a article about the a solid waste situation and recycling. And the focus mm -hmm. of the article would be, um, I mean, I thought of this because if you remember back two years ago or more, ECB was heavily involved in the town's, uh, you know, activities on recycling and so on. Yes. And then, yes. And then that responsibility got turned over to the environmental committee instead. But uh, there was all this talk about what a crisis it was that the landfill was gonna have to close in 2026 or something like that and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. we didn't and and the solution was that we had to beef up our recycling and recycle 60 percent of all the trash rather than whatever it was now which is more like i can't remember 20 or something mm -hmm. so the subject of the article that i think would be of interest if it's possible to get the information is um how are we doing now um, have we in fact succeeded in increasing the percentage of recycling both in our town and countywide and with the other towns? Um, second thing is what options are being looked at for replacing the landfill? And the third one is, well, the third one is sort of similar to the first one uh, or a part of the first one. And that is um, the county has been spending all this money encouraging towns to do different things, take different approaches to recycling. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have been, um, I mean, some of it has been public relations of the sort that, that Caitlin does in our newsletters every month, you know, good information about what you can and can't recycle and so on. Other right. towns have adopted um, economic incentives, that is charging people per bag when they come in with their trash to the to the recycling station. Um, and other towns have done different things. So mm -hmm. I would think that it's, it, it would be very interesting to see an update on um, how the recycling efforts are going. Does it look as if we're going to meet our goal of getting up to 60% by 2026? And what are we going to do about the landfill, whether we whether we meet that goal or not? what are our options? That's a lot of good stuff. I had gotten um, a New York State uh, DEC newsletter either yesterday and there was a little portion about composting solid waste with worms and having this potential composting bin in your house. I don't know, it, it kind of is an, it interested me and I wanted to read more about it, but maybe these can all be incorporated together. Um, perhaps Kate will be supplying us some information between now and when we have to come up with April newsletter so we can put together something that's, uh, you know, really, really uh, an entertaining, interesting article. Would you be interested in having Caitlin come to a uh, ECB meeting and give an update? She's been really working on a lot of that. I know one of the holdups right now is they're waiting for the county final per, uh, report. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, perhaps she or uh, Carla could come and, and do a quick update for you uh, on that and maybe even help out with that topic. I'd be up for that. I mean, I think if they could, you know, present to us in our meeting for a little block of minutes and then we could put some sort of article together for our newsletter. I think that would be really, uh, really great. Yeah, so maybe have a guest author. <laughs> yeah, maybe a guest author, yeah. I was actually gonna suggest something similar that would, like, that was like composting in general, but like uh -huh. it goes along with recycling to just to inform people about 
just the basics, honestly, because I don't know how many people even like the worms thing is just interesting. And isn't it? It's like <laughs> who wants a pet worm compost in your kitchen? But it's yeah, kind of cool. children actually, might really enjoy that, you know. I actually almost bought one like a month ago. <laughs> so I, that's what made me think about it because yeah, about those. Yes, there's been that's been around for a long, long time. They have uh, a box something like a cedar chest, but with air holes. That's new to me. I don't know why. Yes. I've been around a long enough time, but I never heard about it. So yes, they, they grow red worms, not exactly red worms. Yeah, red worms. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe we can all explore that, or those who are interested can and. Uh, maybe correspond between each other with some ideas and yes. well I'd, I'd like to see the um, you know Doug's suggestion of having the girls talk to us would be good yeah that would be great, yeah, would be great. Yeah. and instead of rain barrels uh, rain barrel project we can have worm worm boxes yeah we'll that sounds boxes. really exciting the classic book is Worms Eat My Garbage, and I can't think of the author at the moment, but that's uh, that's been around for quite a long time. But yeah, certainly uh, food food waste filling our landfills is, uh, is, is awful. I mean, a lot of this stuff, plastics, uh, is going to end up in landfills, unfortunately, but there, there yeah. certainly are things that, that can be recycled and, uh, and composted. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it'd be good to get an update on our food recycling program too that we initiated a couple of years back just to see mm -hmm. where that's been. Because mm -hmm. I know it kind of waned a little bit there uh, when we got our first update. The, they were reducing down the numbers of, I guess, containers that needed to be brought in. Um, so that would be good too to have that update. Remind people of it, yeah. Right. Yeah, because I think it was 2018 when we were doing our big kickoff in the highway, the brand new highway barn was open to the public and the ECB was giving away the solid waste recycling containers and the biodegradable bags. And a lot of folks were excited about getting their compost kits. And here we are and it's 21 already. So it's been a couple of years. Yeah, time to revisit. We'll yes. see the fruits of our labor. All right. I, you know, I, I mentioned also, just so you're aware, I have been since, um, and I, I thank Gary at the beginning, but Gary came uh, on a meeting with us the other day uh, with the town board relative to the gypsy moth spraying. I have been getting probably a half a dozen calls a day uh, from residents of the town of Canandaigua interested in the gypsy moss spraying and what the town is going to do and and could the town do more and that sort of thing. So it's definitely mm -hmm. a topical um, uh, issue going on right now. One of the things I, I'll share with you, I did talk with the uh, gentleman uh, from the company there that uh, he said that he has to contract with each individual property owner privately for liability reasons. Uh, so one of the questions that had come up is could the town uh, provide a larger service or could people piggyback through the town, but uh, they would have to, the property owners would have to contact him directly is what he said. But um, there's definitely an interest in that, in that issue. And then it's how do we get the word out to the property owner, owners through whatever means we've been trying to get the word out for other things in our town the the newsletter being a big one yeah yeah doug would we be able to do i guess the spraying at other i guess areas of conservation in the town too under i mean those would be in the town's possession right where i mean if there was applicable areas with wooded areas and whatnot that we would be able to do all those as well Per, perhaps it's um, you know it's sixty dollars an acre is the cost. Um, what the town board gave me the approval to do is to do Onanda Park, um, specifically the uplands is what we've talked about. But it would we could theoretically look at any property that is owned by the town of Canandaigua. But if it's not owned by the town, we wouldn't be able to expend taxpayer resources on the parcel. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And the cemeteries and the other parks are in general less well wooded and the old cemeteries are very small, mm -hmm. mostly. 
the only one I can think of that's pretty well wooded is Sand Hill. And that needs help in many other ways with its trees. <laughs> Like chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> that would require liability insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about Sand Hill is that it is has a vast number of Alanthus trees that are hosts for the spotted lantern flies. Ah, yeah. Yes, and one of the property lines is very indistinct, and that needs to be cleared up before anybody can do anything with trees. But we really, you know, those are, are a, a danger to the farmers and the, the vineyard owners and the apple yeah. tree owners around. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, the aerial spraying, the BTK, doesn't, doesn't touch the spotted lantern flies. No, it doesn't do a thing for them. It, it's, uh, we, would just be very well advised to try to get the Alanthus trees off of town property. Hmm. But you know, that, that whole issue, we discussed that at the last meeting, the recommendation of the ECB was to move forward with that spraying and the town board did authorize us to do that. So yeah, thank so you. that's great. Yeah, I saw that, that was uh, very gratifying. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we helped you at all with article suggestions. Uh, I, feel, I think we can put something together. Um, well, at least we have next month covered, so we can really. When do you think that perhaps Caitlin or who was the other person you mentioned could possibly talk to us with an um, update? Yeah, maybe Carla from the county. She's actually the director of uh, the solid waste for the county. Uh, Caitlin works very okay. closely with her. Um, but let me, let me, I'll send an email. I made some notes here. My list is getting longer, but. Yeah. <laughs> they actually Maybe might like might... to be able to do an article for us and, and send it through yeah. better, you know? If we can focus on the solid waste aspect, maybe to start, you know, really okay. expand on solid waste recycling. Right. Then we can get into the worms. <laughs> we can do the worms another time if we, we can do the worms another time it's a long year <laughs> okay so and, should we uh, jump so solid waste recycling how about that for april there you go fantastic it's a good time people are, are starting to think about getting women? outside yeah right all right uh the next one there the town hall display case i don't um uh, Edith well, I since that's my charge, I would like to ask the other ECB me board members if they have a particular thing that they might like to put up for display. I've done it for a couple of times and I can always do something more, but I don't uh, have exclusive rights over it. So if, um, you know, if Gary wants to put up something with the plastics or anyone has something else they would like to put on the display, we can certainly do that. I thought uh, we would try to change them out about four times a year, possibly five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that the footprints in the snow is still quite topical at this point. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but, um, so if, if any of you have something that you would like to put up as an educational display, you know, I would be happy to help if needed or to, uh, you know, have you uh, put up something that you're interested in. If we have an, an article coming up about trees, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it would be a nice thing for the, for the, the display case to see if we could get some children to to do artwork about trees and uh, particularly about trees you know special trees that are in the town and it could include a drawing from a from you know a young person and then maybe a little bit of a report about that type of tree um, I mean this is the kind of thing that would require the help of a teacher <laughs> 
or 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 a daycare provider or something yeah. like that. Uh, I don't know that we have any contacts among young people. Well, Justin, you have contacts. I have, I have a solid volunteer that would be willing to do it. <laughs> and possibly two if she's up for it. <laughs> that would be great. Well, it'll be, like it'll it be an all day minute expose. <laughs> Yeah, no, if that's something, definitely. I, I know my kids would be uh, stoked to do something like that. Uh, <laughs> do, do you know, out, you know any, any, any um, you know, people who are around young kids all the time and particularly doing art projects that, I mean, our kids always love to see their work publicized. So uh, it would mm -hmm. bring people into City Hall, like our town hall. I guess that's mm -hmm. not to be encouraged these days, but maybe by spring it would be. Yeah, I mean, that's a I great idea. That. I'm my mom's a teacher, a fifth grade teacher. Oh, oh, hey. perfect. <laughs> perfect. Uh, yeah, maybe okay. some of the art teachers at um, um, at, at the, the middle school or the elementary school. Um, yeah, ask your mom. Yes, yes. Maybe her class would like to do something. That would be maybe good. she'd like to be a guest, uh, a, a guest editor. <laughs> I guess displayer. Yes. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That would be great fun. And and Edith, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but the uh, the the piece that uh, you you all collectively did, and I know you had started on the uh, the spotted. I'm going to mess up the name of it, but the, spotted lantern. Line, yes. Line. So that we we ended up doing a little brochure rack right there next to the display or with the display case, so okay. it's right there. So people have been grabbing some of those. So good, good. I'm glad. Thank you. Of course. Okay. So anything else on the display case we need to touch on? No. Um, eventually, I'm going to do something. I don't know either there or for the newsletter about. Um, pruning trees, <laughs> partly because we don't want anyone pruning their oak trees between the time the, the buds develop and the leaves drop, because that's what exposes them to oak wilt. <laughs> right. And there are good ways to prune trees and, and not, but uh, that's just yeah. something I've got in mind for later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we touched on the vacancy earlier, new business member reports. I don't know if... Uh, if anyone has anything to. Uh... Yes, I would like to, uh, the town tree board is something that I'm connected with. One of the things that, that we would like is for people to recommend trees that they would like to see planted in the parks. So if, uh, if we are going to be doing any plantings, um, Particularly, I would like to have people recommend things that they would like to see and possibly a little, you know, why do you like this kind of tree? Is it, is it one that blooms? Does it have great habitat value? Are there native trees that uh, would be appropriate and so on? So if you have uh, uh, recommendations for the kinds of trees we ought to be looking at in the parks or in the old cemeteries, um, email them to me or to Dennis Brewer. Okay. Um, on the local history team, one of the projects we've been talking about is a, um, a up, upgrading the display at Onanda Park. Um, there's a kiosk that is at the right, right near the um, where Barnes Gully goes under, or Barnes Creek goes under the road. Um, there's a there's a, a little roofed kiosk and it has three panels on it and the panels um, are could could use some new artwork in them. Um, they mostly have projects of of uh, campers or students left over from the old Nature Nuts program. So they're you know kids pictures of nature. Um, and there's also some stuff about the upland trails and the habitats and what you expect to see up there. Um, what we'd like to do is to have one of those panels be about the history of Onanda Park and particularly um, uh, Camp Onanda. 
Um, there are some great images of Campo Nanda from the 20s and uh, all, all the way through its history. So there's a lot of a lot of good raw material for one about the history of the site. Um, the other two panels, we were thinking there ought to be one about the natural history of the park. Um, and I was going to ask Edith if you might be willing to work on us with that. Or yes, I would. On that. Um, you know, fossils and trees and wildflowers right. and, and, and uh, you know, birds and red apps and, and all the, the all the stuff. Paint. And then yes, yes, I would be very pleased to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. And then for the third one, um, uh, we were kind of thinking, well, maybe the town's recreation program should have the opportunity to put something there for whatever programs might be happening in Onanda Park. But then there's the difficulty that if you do something like this, it's probably going to be there for at least ten years. <laughs> so it's hard to predict what the recreation programs might be. Um, so we're kind of open about what the third panel ought to be. But anyway, do you have any ideas? Or maybe two of them could be about natural history. Or actually one idea would be to have a really good map of the trail system. Um, because, you know, people who are, unfortunately, it's not right near the parking lot, so not everybody sees it. But still, it would be good to have a map of the upland trail system and what you can expect to see where, where the overlooks are, where the paths cross, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Then where the cabins are. So um, those are a couple ideas. Very good. That's all, that's all great. Um, Sarah, Linda, just so you know too, as you get into that, so um, we're going to be launching pretty soon um, that we're, we've just been bombarded by this uh, possible land acquisition stuff, but um, pretty soon we'll be <clears throat> launching uh, some sort of a, a new team, uh, whatever the case, looking at specifically uh, Onanda and the uplands of Onanda and what the future uh, build out of Onanda might look like, whether that's additional or replacing cabins or moving cabins around, whether it's uh, tent sites, whether it's uh, any number of different things. And so I know we want to put together a team on that. So um, keep that in mind as you as you think about the, the different things, because maybe there's some information we might be able to also kind of help share there so that we can, uh, you know, get additional information from the public on what they'd like to see and everything there. Okay. Um, the conservation easement team, I'm... Uh, waiting for uh, some response there. We had hired Barb Johnson uh, to uh, Labella uh, to actually help us rewrite the conservation easement section of the town code. Um, I, just waiting for an update on that. I think that's getting pretty close to where we'll have something to take a look at and uh, start to provide some comments on. So that'll be coming uh, hopefully very soon. So, um, and then some municipal boot camps that are coming up here February and March. Uh, different opportunities there that uh, things are coming up. Um, and it looks like, uh, John, thank you so much for listing all those and, and providing those. And there is the contact information uh, right there on the agenda. MRB Group is uh, one of the sponsors of all those. Oh. The, our town engineer. And uh, Matt Horn, uh, specifically, I give a shout out to Matt. Matt's the former city manager of the city of Geneva. He's worked in municipalities all over the country. He's very, very knowledgeable. He works very closely with us with our economic development group. So uh, uh, he, it's always a quality training. It's always a quality presentation. I was, uh, I was at an international manager's conference um, a couple of years ago, and one, I was shocked. I didn't even know he was going to be speaking. One of the presenters was Matt Horn and uh, did a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal presentation. So he's, uh, he's, he's definitely on top of things. He's a sharp guy. Um, and then the rest of the trainings there. So I don't, does anybody else have anything else? I don't know if we have another privilege on the floor. So we need to touch one? No? If not, I guess that will conclude our meeting for this evening, if we could have a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, in a second. Oh, yes. Yeah, at 6.15, <laughs> all those in favor? Anyone opposed to adjourning? Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for thank taking you. the time. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Good to see you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.